You don't know my story, so judge me not. Every sector of our lives is pretty much pretty much under construction. Family under construction. Career under construction. Relationships under construction. Emotions. I know mine live under construction. Finances under construction. We might as well be under, under construction, construction together. together. Welcome to Under Construction with your girl Tamar Braxton. Well, everybody, we've made it to the final week of April. And y'all, what that productivity looking like, huh? I want that out. Do you feel like you're on track to closing out the month winning? I sure hope so. Because if you've been putting in the work, we should start seeing the fruits of all your labor coming up real soon. And if you feel like life is a constant struggle, baby, just keep on going. Don't give up because at any moment you can just receive your breakthrough. Okay. Yes. That one, the one you've been waiting on. Okay. So if things seem hard in this moment, just remember that trouble don't last always. And most importantly, keep in mind that you're not alone. You have an entire UC crew cheering you on and speaking prosperity over your life. Okay. Now, if you're killing the game right now, you know your sister's proud of you and I'm cheering you on, okay? I'm praying for your abundance. Hell, all of our abundance, right? Now, if you didn't know, this month is Financial Literacy Month and it's only right that we speak some financial wealth into our lives. So this week affirmation, which you all should be writing down and reciting to yourselves daily as we speak financial abundance over our lives, okay? Get your pen and paper out. Because I'm going to need for you to be ready for this one. All right. Here we go. I welcome financial abundance. I am capable of wisely handling financial success. <sighs> that right there is a word. Now, y'all know the quote, to whom much is given, much is required. And while our affirmation makes it known that we are not just asking for financial abundance. No, we're not going to stop right there. We're making it clear that we have the means <coughs> of handling such responsibility, Holy Ghost, universe. Let's write them in the stars because that's what we need. So let's just say this thing one more time because it's blessing me still right now. I welcome financial abundance. I am capable of wisely handling financial success. Now look, everybody, I'm speaking this affirmation over my life while also letting the desires of my heart be known to God. Now, if you stand in agreement with me, let me hear the church say what? The who? Amen and amen. Okay. Today on Tamar's Takes, we're talking distractions. And I was recently reading the article that said that distractions can quickly kill your goals and your dreams. And I literally, y'all, couldn't read another sentence because I was so taken aback by that statement. How many times have you been distracted by things that took your focus off the things that really mattered? <laughs> I got to put my hand in the air. It's been so many times, y'all. And guess what? Months later, that distraction ain't even relevant no more. How about that? Now, I thought about it. I'm like, y'all know what? Distractions can come in many forms. And I thought about relationships. Now, relationship issues can be a distraction, especially if it's with someone that you don't even really care about. Whew, that's a word for me. Now, how many times we don't worry about somebody who we really ain't worried about? <laughs> Too many. Now, business opportunities can also distract you. Now, if you're not clear on what you should be focusing your time and attention on, you can spread yourself way too thin, attempting to do a little bit of everything for every single body and then knock you right off your track. You ain't even got time for you. Now, how about this one? Other people's drama can become a huge distraction because you get so sucked into something that ain't got nothing to do with you. That was for somebody. Yep, that somebody was you. You are soaking up all your energy and your time and attention to something that ain't got nothing to do with you, boo. Stay out of people's business. All right, well, I'm not sure if these are distractions for you, so I want you to take the time to identify what's absorbing all of your time. Is it TV, social media, one of the things I talked about before? Well, whatever it is, please don't allow distractions to rob you of fulfilling your dreams, hopes, and desires, boo. Okay? Y'all know these are just my thoughts. This is kind of how I truly feel about it. But, again, it's just Tamar's takes on distraction. All right, I'm going to keep it a thou thou. Hey, man, it is all me. All right, everybody, it's time to tap into that keep it a thou thou inbox and pull out a few questions for your girl, Tay Tay. Let's see what we got today. 
Hi Tamar, I'm 18 and about to graduate high school. This should be the time of my life where I should be celebrating the fact that I've made it this far and I'm about to hit this great achievement. But instead, I'm stressed out. What are some tips to use to stop stressing out and just enjoy the moment? Okay, Becky, listen, here is the thing. You 18 years old, please stop putting more on you than what you need. You're still a teenager, okay? Ride that teenager title till the wheels fall off of that thing, okay? Don't worry about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, take one day at a time. Stop anticipating what problems you are going to have in your life. You don't know what God has for you. So if you take one day at a time, you put him first, you put your studies first, you put your goals and your dreams first, you'll be fine. Life is going to, you know, throw you curveballs and, you know, snatch your wig off every now and then. But you don't have to always be prepared for it. Stop preparing yourself for trouble. All right. Now, what we got for number two? Hey, Mar, I'm so excited that the school year is finally winding down. Well, I can at least see the end in sight. So with all this COVID stuff going on, though, I still don't know what I'm going to do with my child for the summer. Have you made plans for what Logan will do over the summer? Look, I'm just going to keep it a thou thou with you, boo. I, we ain't doing nothing this summer because that's not my coin. Okay? That's not my coin because that was not my coin during the wintertime. So therefore, I could not save up for this harvest of the summer. We're going to use this pool. That the Lord has provided us with. We're going to use that. Okay. We're going to use this barbecue pit. We're going to act like we are in Turks and Caicos. We act like we're in Bahamas. We're going to act like we're in Jamaica. Okay. That's what we're going to do. We're going to keep this real budget friendly this summer at home in our backyard until the next summer when I can save up for the harvest. Put your wallets in the air and give me an amen. Amen and amen. Okay. <laughs> well, everybody, that was super fun. And I truly hope that my responses proved to be beneficial to your situations. Now, if you'd like to have your questions answered during an upcoming episode of Under Construction, just shoot your girl a note to you see with Tamar at gmail.com. That's the letters you see with Tamar at gmail.com. Now, look, I ain't got all the answers, everybody, but you can always count on me to keep it a thou thou. Up next... We're going into the blueprint. This, this is the blueprint. Come on, y'all. Let's go. More often than not, fans of celebrities come to experience them once they've reached a certain status. They're rarely there for their entire journey or through the real grind to make it. I would say that celebrity blogger and host and my friend Jason Lee knows this reality all too well. Now today we're going to take you back so you can have a full appreciation of his present as the founder and host of Hollywood Unlocked. All right, y'all, we're just going to dive in. Ting, ting, you're on. That's the whole point. <laughs> oh, you just got to be ready to go. You just talk. Well, Tamar, you have to give me a warning because I'm still under construction. I, my teeth is under construction. My no, it's not. Yes, it is. You're not going to do anything to your teeth, are you? No. no. Okay, good. Because they're perfect. I mean, you're pretty much already at perfection. Do you feel like you're at perfection right now? No. I mean, I just lost 114 pounds, so I do feel like I'm getting closer to my the best version of myself. But um, I'm I'm over being a perfectionist in the imperfect world. That's just the, not the, even a The goal. best version of yourself is a number, do you think? No, because I did say when I started the weight loss journey, I wanted to lose 100 pounds. Because, you know, I was 330. No, I was 322 pounds. Yeah. And I'm like, well, might as well just keep going to 200. I don't know that a number reflects, you know, being anything. I just want to be healthy and feel healthy. You know, I the number used to re reflect on who I was and how I felt about myself. So I stopped getting on scales. I don't even have a scale anymore. Really? Yes. So if I wasn't a certain weight, if I wasn't like a, a certain range, I would feel bad about myself and I wouldn't feel pretty. Really? Absolutely. But what yeah. did the number what did the, what did the number represent to you? Okay, so, you know, working on myself, I discovered that I had body image issues. <laughs> mm. this movie. So like if I was like a certain weight, I would automatically feel fat. But you were still out there on stage dancing with them little outfits on where you could see more skin than you would see on me. Well, you know, you fake it till you make it, you know, Man. and I was so used to like uh, making things fit. I know how to make things fit and make mm -hmm. things work very well. Like, I'm one of the best. <laughs> well, every, everybody would say, oh, man, I didn't even know you was that big back then. I'm like, proper lighting, angles, clothes. You, you know figure what it I'm out. Saying? You figure it out. But what you can do, even though you can hide the pounds, you can't hide the weight that you're carrying. For me, I think the weight was a reflection of all of the trauma I had been through. And it wasn't until I yeah. wrote my book 
when I wrote the book, God must have forgotten about me and started working through it psychologically. I started saying like, damn, I had been through all this trauma and I was going out talking to people and they were like, I can't believe you've been through this. I can't believe you've been through that. And when I think about it, I looked at myself, I'm like, I'm carrying it all. Like I see yeah. it now. Now I can see it. And yeah. it was my my podcast when Jennifer Lewis said, uh, Jennifer Lewis had come on the show and she said, have you ever gone in the mirror and just looked at yourself and said, I love you until you cry? And I'm thinking like, Girl, ain't nobody got time to be looking at myself, talking to myself in the bathroom. And I, and I tried it one day and I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror. And that, that's when I started figuring like, OK, I got to do some work. I got to do yeah. some work. That's when it started. Did you really feel that God forgot about you? I mean, I think at some point in life when we go through things, we're thinking like, damn, like there ain't nobody looking out for me. My mother had yeah. given me up to the foster care system. My yeah. father had never been in my life. My yeah. family had kind of abandoned me. I had been molested. I felt discarded yeah. and abandoned. So at some point you just like. Well, what am I here for? You know, God, yeah. God looking out for everybody else. On top of that, there were bad people winning all around me. So yeah. I was really caught up in like, why are they still living? But then uh, but then you realize like you go through things and God shows you like if you have the faith to get up every day that you're going to make it through eventually. And so I had to have uh, I just started to really, uh, you know, get into the higher power and really understand like God's always been there. You know, that's I'm a survivor of it. all. I'm not a victim of what I went through. Right. So, I mean, are we saying that Jason Lee is saved? <laughs> well, <laughs> is Jason Lee saved? Well, if you go to Bigo, I'm not sanctified, but I am saved. <laughs> I don't think most people would, like, associate that. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you don't like, you. So? I don't think so. I don't think so. I think people, people see this. I'm just going to go ahead and say, it, you know, this bullshit facade that you like to show people all the time that I can't stand. <laughs> but you know what? Yeah, I will say when I first started Hollywood Unlocked, the concept was I know all these celebrities. I'm going to build the platform they can trust and I'm going to let them tell their side. Like it's going to be their platform to tell their side. And celebrities didn't gravitate towards me. Even friends were like afraid of me because they knew I knew all the TT. Right. Yeah. So they were like, eh. and so people started acting funny. And it wasn't until I did my podcast where I just said, you know, fuck it. This is what you get. I'm going to wake up whatever I feel and say you're going to get it. Because if it's in me, the Lord gave it to me. However, Come the on, the Lord gave it to me. <laughs> <laughs> you better be in the kingdom. <laughs> and so I started I started playing into this guy and it just became this thing that people loved or hated. Yeah. But, you know, like certain people like you, it's kind of funny because when I'm talking to you, you'll be like. You you see me through the bullshit and it's kind of annoying because I kind of just love who I've created because that, that nigga will let you get close, but close enough to where you don't, you, you're not too close. Yeah. But you see through it. Yeah. Some people that get to know me, they know that, you know, I do have a heart, but, you know, I can still let your ass have it though. Yeah. You know, I'm one of those saved kind of people. You know, I'm mm -hmm. like a sipping, cussing Christian who really loves the Lord. <laughs> like yeah. for real, for real. Yeah. So let me ask you a question. Like with you being one of those people like me, <laughs> do you feel bad about some stories you post? No. Or report? You don't? No, because they're, they're boundaries. Like I don't, we don't talk about people's children and we don't right. out people. So at the end of the day, we're just reflecting what you're doing. You know, whatever. You, <laughs> wait, whatever. wait. Wait, man, don't say you don't out people. That is not true. <laughs> No, I don't. I don't out people. No, you don't. No, you spilled AT. Oh, I'm saying, you, I'm saying, I'm saying, I'm saying, I don't out like men who are down low. Yeah, I don't out. Okay. Them. Yeah. No, no. I'll, I'll out your T if it's T. But, but is I there a difference between like? Yeah, yeah. No, it is because I feel like the things that you're doing, like you're doing them. So why are you mad at me for talking about what you're doing? You know. I, but shouldn't they talk about it first? I mean, should you not be doing it at all? I mean, ding, ding, ding. No, I mean, like, you shouldn't. Like, like, if you're out here cheating, if you cheating on your woman at the club <laughs> and I see it and I say it, why is it my fault that you cheated? You cheated. So why won't you use that same energy and out somebody? It's the same thing. Because as a gay man, I know that we live in a world where there are people who are killing themselves as a result of being outed to the world who hasn't fully embraced that part of the world yet. And, you know, we've embraced that niggas ain't shit. We've embraced that some women ain't shit. Uh, <laughs> and we've embraced that there are some people who are alive who ain't never going to be shit. So we've embraced yeah. that. So the, there's a little more cushion to like, okay, you cheated on your wife. Like, remember the, the man Derek Jackson who cheated on his girl? She came out in the bonnet. I don't know who that is. <laughs> Derek, Derek Jackson, he's I know a, he, who that is. Okay. 
But you know, like, you cheated on your girl. You made millions of dollars talking about your relationship expert, and you cheated on your girl with multiple women. Like, why would we not talk about I don't that? Know, I understand why everybody acts like that's the story that we haven't heard before. Like, that is a story of we've them heard all. many times, exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So, since you don't believe in outing people... How did you come out? You know, I, somebody asked me that. I never had a, I don't have a coming out story. I just. What do you mean? My family never heard the words I'm gay from my mouth until I was on the reunion of Love and Hip Hop. Never. Because there was never what? a reason. Yeah, because why do I owe anybody an explanation of who I'm sleeping with? Like, I just never felt like I needed to have a coming out experience. So I never had one. I just, I'm out. So they just, you never said anything. You just had dates with guys? Well, I think when I was younger, you know, I had the homie. <laughs> you know, <laughs> who always spent the night because he never wanted to go home. And then later on, you know, Thanksgiving, you bring, you know, a different cute nigga every year. But, you know, all my friends just happen to be cute. It just was something we just didn't talk about. Yeah. I didn't feel obligated to explain to people like, yo, this is my boyfriend or this is what I, like for why? I just didn't feel like I needed to do that because straight people don't walk in the room and go, everybody, I'm straight. So, like, why do I have to come out and say I'm gay? Like, Why? Do you think that's a result of your trauma? I think it's a result of really not giving a fuck what people think of me. Like, I don't really care. I yeah. don't care what anybody thinks of me. I don't yeah, wake but up. why? But why? Because everybody kind of cares. Why don't you care? I will tell you, I had a moment the other day. I was, ironically, I was taking a shit. You know, when you <sighs> take a shit, you got time to sit with yourself. Oh, my God. My no. friend Jason has showed up. <laughs> <laughs> I was taking a shit. So I had a moment to think. And I thought about... And this is going to sound crazy to the people out there that don't believe I believe in God. I was thinking about, like, how good God is. Yeah. I met I met Rihanna, and the first thing out her mouth, it could have been anything. The first thing out her mouth, she said, I know it's hard being friends with people like me because of the job that you do. But as a businesswoman, I respect how you built your brand. And mm-hmm. I thought about the validation that she gave me. And I think I moved so fast in doing the work and meeting people and this and that and how much I love her. Or even talking to you, right? Being here on your show. Like, I think about the validation that shows up in different ways. So I think about that and I go, man, I really did. And then the, and then the next night when we hung out, Rihanna said, by the way, I saw you honor your brother, your dead brother on Love and Hip Hop. And I just want to tell you, like, that was really beautiful to see. And like that moment for me was like major validation and where I cared what she said because I love her so much. And the fact that she said to me back, like, the work that you're doing matters. I see you. I see you. When I talk to you, if I'm, like, talking shit about, you know, these upcoming rappers who are out here in the streets, ain't gonna say no names, and you call me, you say, hey, you know, like, relax. You know what I mean? Like, be nice. You know, I feel guilty because I I know you see I see your text, so I have to respond. But I don't really want to respond because at that moment, I don't want to be nice. When people do see me for who I am, that validation, that kind of validation does matter because it's like, damn, like this person actually sees me through, you know, what I've created. You know, I used to say, like, I don't care. And I and I realized through counseling, I used to use that as a defense mechanism. Do you feel like that's a part of it? You know, uh, Charlemagne always tells me that I need to go to therapy. <laughs> You're not in therapy. I'm not, I don't. I don't have a good therapist yet. Do you have a good therapist? Oh, I have a few. Okay. If you <laughs> if you really have a good therapist, I am. I just changed my uh, medical coverage to be able to get a independent therapist. Yeah. Uh, I do want to go to that therapy. That must be some rich people insurance. I don't have that insurance. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I, want- I haven't. I haven't done the work yet. Uh, yeah to know if what it is. But I think it's one of those things where like, I just have learned how to compartmentalize the people in my life. So the people that matter, I listen to them. And then the people that don't matter, I don't. So I have a very few people that I let rent space in my head with helping helping to navigate through this world. Like, you know, if if Floyd Mayweather calls me and says, hey, you should try this, you should try that. When it comes to business, I listen to him. I may not listen to him in relationships, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, he's a Pisces male. (laughs) A true Pisces male. But I, yeah, but I've, I've compartmentalized like who I let Rent space in my head. Oh, yeah. You are the um, number one compartmentalized mental person. I mean, like, you do it so well. Like, why? Like, take me because back. Why? You, 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 don't have, you don't have a lot of people that try to control. Tamar, I know you have a lot of people that try to control you. They do it I subtly. No, they still do it. I'm going to tell you. Okay, go we, ahead. Bust we, it. All, we all have that friend that says, nah, I wouldn't talk to that person because they this. Or, nah, I wouldn't go over here because they that. They're literally trying to control 
you. In your yeah. mind, they've tricked you to believe because you like them so much that they're looking out for you. Yeah. Until you, until you can really get into their intentions. Because I had a friend that was in my ear every day. And it wasn't until one day he moved a little different. Mm-hmm. that I took a step back and started watching him move. And I was consciously paying attention. And this nigga was literally controlling me. I cut that motherfucker off the next day. Wow. He let and a slip so, show. He let a slip show because he was benefiting from all of the fruit of my labor by being around and being in the rooms and then trying to control anybody else getting close to me so he could keep me under his control and be my plus one everywhere. And I, I didn't I didn't want that. So I learned that like you have to really consciously know everybody's intentions in your life and know that at some point they could shift and it's okay. You just got to be able to put them in a different compartment. You know yeah. what I mean? Those people are so good at that, aren't they? <laughs> you know, you know. <laughs> you know, I'm not even going to give you an area to even go there. Cause I know you can't wait. You over there shaking. In your mm-hmm. You see, I got my paperwork. You want some paperwork? <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. I don't. Um, but what I do want to know is, are you willing to share your trauma? Sure, absolutely. And, yeah, and I want to know details. Is that okay? Of course. Okay. So wh- which trauma, which one you want to talk about? Which one about? do you want to share? Which one haven't you shared? Well, um, I mean, my book, I literally have opened up about everything. I think the one thing that I, I kind of was on Beagle and got a little emotional about the other day was that people were saying, you know, people say to me like, oh, you know, your father's getting older and you should forgive him because I went back to Love and Hip Hop after I left the show to kind of uh, to kind of set up my book coming out by showing my family life a little bit. Because yeah. I think people people kind of see me as like an emotionless tree that doesn't have feelings. And so I wanted to show a little bit about how I got to where I am. and How you feel sometimes. Yeah, how I feel. <laughs> and... Uh, I, I when I think about that, I think about all the people that just automatically forgive their family because there's a bloodline. And I just don't think that people have the right to be in your life if they've hurt you. Like when just because you're my family does not give you a pass to pain. Like you don't get to subject things in my life that, you know, I have to endure and carry for the rest of this life, this one life that I live because you're my relative. I think when my father you haven't showed up in my life. He's never said I'm proud of you. I've never had him sleep in my house one night because he's always been married to his wife. My mother was a side chick. And so now that I'm Jason Lee, you don't get to show up and be proud of me and be the father of Jason Lee when you were not Jason's dad. You know what I mean? And I think where I'm at is I have a lot of people that, you know, try to say to me again, trying to control me. Oh, you got to forgive him. He's getting older. You know how much time he's going to have left. He's not doing well. His time is with God. My, his time with me, he never wanted. I, I'm not going to reverse that for him. And and so I learned to forgive him a long time ago and say, good luck with whatever life you have left. And I'm fine. But I think the part that I'm dealing with is how is that thing going to show up in my relationships with other people? And how am I, my other family members who don't understand that I have become this person where I, I, I built my world and I'm very comfortable in it. And some people just they're on the outside looking through the window now. They don't have a key and they don't have an a, a invitation to that world. So, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm learning how to be OK with that and make sure that I don't I'm not OK. I'm not doing that with animosity because there's no animosity. Just that I don't want people in my life that are just here because of who I am now and when they weren't here for me when I needed them. So yeah. I'm not one of those friends who, you know, I'm not a yes person. <laughs> you know, I'm just, I can only share my own experiences. And, you know, because it is your dad, you know, people are like, yeah, you know, forgive your dad, this, that, and the other. But I'm going to tell you as your friend, you have to forgive on your own time. Yeah. Well, I'll say this. Forgiveness, what I learned, like when my mother passed away, you know, before she passed away, I was telling the story again on Bego, saying that, because, <laughs> you know, I, lo- I logged into Bego to talk about a different topic. But then yeah. literally, and I know y'all going to be surprised about this, the Lord sent a different message. I the ain't Lord, surprised. When I logged in, what came over me was gratitude. Okay, you're actually getting ready to talk to people who are showing up for you. There are people yeah. that never showed up for you who were supposed to show up for you. Your mother didn't Period. show up for you. Your fa- I, that just started coming over me. I'm like, well, okay. And I started talking about it. And what I said was, when my mother passed away, the one thing that she asked me when literally I'm in the room with her as she's literally about to pass away, she wanted to, to meet. She wanted to know that I forgave her for everything that she had done to me, not believing I was mm. molested, abandoning me, abusing me, the psychological damage, the abandonment, all that, all that. She wanted to know that I forgave her. And I was able to internalize the request to the extent that 
my spirit forgave her and I released that to her and she, and, and and she was able to pass away with with that peace. And and when I think about my dad, you know, I I have forgiven him for not being a man. I have forgiven him for not knowing how to be a father to me and all the other children that he parented outside of his marriage. I have forgiven him for being the example of what a black man should not be. I have forgiven him for all those indiscretions. The one thing that I have not forgiven him, and this is the one thing that I hang on to and why our relationship has gone south, because I always looked at him as like, that's my dad, that's my dad, that's my dad. And I think there was that certain fear and respect that came along with him being my dad because he was my dad. Mm -hmm. But the moment my brother died, and he betrayed my brother the way that he did. That was because my brother was like my father and my brother was the closest family member to me who I love the most. For him to be murdered the way that he was, the trauma that that caused, and then the reflection over his death that I've been able to look and see how my dad did him dirty. That was the decision for me that I just don't know how to get past what you did until you can acknowledge it, own it, and 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 in some way rectify it. You may not be able to rectify it in all ways financially because of what, everything you stole from him and took from him, but you have to acknowledge what you did to him and and own it for me to understand that you that 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 hurt me. That hurt me. That that hurt my family. That hurt my other siblings. He just refuses to do that. He's an older man, come from the south. You know, it is what it is. And and I'm and I've moved on to the extent that now I live my life and I'm cool. But. I'm not looking for daddy to show up anymore. I'm not, I'm not, I'm off that. Really, literally, like, even if I go to therapy, lay on the couch, yes, Lord, yes, no, I really I'm am, okay. <laughs> I really am okay with understanding that that chapter of my life for now is closed. I get it. We're speaking with my friend Jason Lee of Hollywood Unlocked. Stay with us. We're back into the blueprint talking with the multimedia mogul, Jason Lee, about his journey to Hollywood. I get it. Been there, you know. And until, you know, God reveals to you that this is something that, I don't know. I don't even know if, if, if he will because sometimes things are just simply not ours. <laughs> no, he, he did. You know? I, I, th I think God did. And the way he did it was when I went back to Love and Hip Hop, the whole time mm -hmm. I was with that show, I wanted to show, I wanted to be able to highlight broken families coming back together. Like not, not with the intention of combat for TV, but like, let's literally show how we have com conflict and work through a real issue, how death separated our family and work it out. Because if you want to be friend, if you want to be Jason Lee's dad privately, because he's a public figure, then you have to also be Jason's dad publicly like there's Absolutely. no we're not gonna hide behind you, you, we're not doing that so let's talk about it and he didn't show up for me then and i remember doing that scene and saying to myself if he don't show up for me now god i'm out because i'm giving him another i'm giving him a chance as a conscious adult to show up and he chose not to and i think oftentimes where people are, are victimized by their parents in this way you keep showing up to be let down well, you don't owe them that you don't owe them the opportunity to victimize you again. At some point, you got to take control of your life and say, you know what? God bless you. <laughs> I'm going to let God deal with you because you're not going to do this to me anymore. And that was my decision of saying, you know, as a kid, I had no control over you showing up. But as an adult, I know one thing. You didn't show up for me now. God, God bless you. And I'm out. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, you got to you got to stop the abuse and trauma, you mm -hmm. know, from, you know, inflicting on your life. But I, a lot of people don't know what your daddy did. I don't think I know. <laughs> so, so my brother, his name is Rodney Townsend. He was yeah. twenty. He was twenty six years old. I was nineteen years old. I had met Queen Latifah when I was fifteen. Uh, I had been inspired by her to just kind of like start traveling outside of my hometown. And at sixteen, I would come to L.A. and hang out at Living Single, and I'd be around the industry. And I got bit by the bug of wanting to be in entertainment. Didn't really know what, but I, you know, at nineteen. I was heavily in the streets. I had been shot by then. I was out there and, and I wanted to get out of my community and move to L.A. and, and make a, a life for myself. What do so you I mean you were shot by then? You was a thug? I, w I was thug like thuggish. I was in the streets, but I wasn't a gangbanger. But I was I was hanging with all the I was hanging in the streets, Dang, but I okay, wasn't. Got it. So 19, I decided to move to L.A. I happened to go on a way party. And uh, my brothers come, my cousins come, or whatever. And long story short, a woman kills my brother at my going away party. When we talk about trauma, like that's probably the most traumatic situation that I've gone through. I fell into depression. I fell into just like, this probably is the lowest moment of my life. And my father wasn't there for me emotionally, but the part that bothered me was, my brother was in the streets. He was, you know, he had sold dope and did different things. My, my father had taken 
those of you that know drugs, two kilos is a lot of drugs. He took two kilos of cocaine and he basically sold it and then kept all the money. He didn't give it to his baby's mother. My brother had had a daughter, his first and only, his first uh, biological child six weeks before he got murdered. He didn't leave no money for his daughter. He didn't make sure that the baby mom had anything. He didn't look out for her the way that he should have. They, he gave all his property away, sold his car to, his, to my uncle, his brother, totally treated my brother's property like it was at, like, a, like a swap meet. And all I wanted was a memento to remember my brother because this was like an important person in my life. And it was an opportunity for him to be a man and to bring all of his children together and help us bond over the passing of one of our siblings. And he just missed that opportunity and was very, very absent. And then that to me was, that was a lot. That, that was the, that was the, what they say, the straw that broke the camel's back because mm-hmm. you already brought me into a world where you were married to your wife and my mother was raising a a black child as a white woman in the set in the 80s where her family was racist and then she ended up getting into drugs and then couldn't take care of me anymore and you let me go into the system out of all your children to all these children i have 10 brothers and sisters i was the only one to go into the system and so really? Yeah. And so this may come out and sound like animosity, but it's just literally me describing the trauma that I went through. I don't I don't wake up any day with daddy issues and say, oh, my God, I wish my father was like, I'm no, I don't have that. I just am telling you that's that's what I went through. him. You have daddy issues. I love you. You think so? <laughs> what? You, but how do daddy issues show up? Like, how would it show up? You know, I'm not going to get on here and spill your tea like that. You know, I ain't finna do that. I'm a real friend. <laughs> no, no. I, I, Are you kidding I, me? I don't think I have daddy issues. Oh, all day. All day, every day. Know what it look like, smell like, taste like. <laughs> I, I don't think so. <laughs> look you like. Know, and that's where the work is going to come in because if I oh, do. Oh, yeah. If I do, I want to work through him because I've already had my moment with him where I told him what I thought of him. And, and why. I mean, like I had that breaky moment where I literally put it all out. Uh, in front of his wife, too. It was real Jerry Springer-ish. I was like, and you cheated on her with all these women and had all these kids. And you did. I mean, I, I read him for Phil. But I don't know. <laughs> maybe because I don't think about him. I guess I don't think I have the issues. But hell, maybe I do. Uh, I, you do think about him. And it's not direct... Um, but it shows up in your day. De- yes, you do, Jason. I'm te- <laughs> Jason, I'm in therapy every day, bro. <laughs> and I'm not a professional. But well, I'm then- telling you, like, it shows up in your relationships and how you choose to have them, lack thereof. But <laughs> relationships, what? relationships like with people or like the niggas that I fly out? Like, which relationships? You, you're not attached to nothing. No, I'm not. It's, no. So is that the daddy whatever. issue? But yes, is that the daddy issue. Is that the daddy issue or is that just your... the issue? Because remember, I was abandoned by my mom, too. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's abandonment. But listen, especially as a, a son, you know what I'm saying? We, I think, I, I, I don't want to say too much on here. Say <laughs> whatever. I just don't, no, because I just don't feel like it's everybody's business because... I am what, under construction. Lay no, the not you. Down. You know, what? not you. I don't want to tell other people's business. Okay, you see what I'm it. saying? I think so, that as you're, you're, sons, you're they look for daddy's validation and acceptance. Mm. It's true. But because you know, women, we look, we look for that through our moms. You know what I'm saying? We want our mothers to look, yep, that's the bad bitch I, I, I raised, yep. Yep, she ended up with the right guy. Look at her house. Look at her kids. Yeah, we want that. Guys want that. They act like they don't, but they all want to be accepted by their dads, especially as a gay man. What are you talking about? I did yeah. want to be. I did want to be loved and validated. I can hear. Okay, I did want to be loved and validated by my brother who passed away. And he did that. He loved me. He Mm -hmm. validated me. He, in my mind, was my father figure. He protected me. He guided me. He supported me. He wanted the best out of my life. He told me and reaffirmed completely and consistently that I was going to be successful and all these things. So my brother who passed on was my father figure. My father was never there. So I don't see him. I never have saw him in my mind as my father. I know he's my father. But I don't know him to be my father the way a father would parent their son. So I'm not I, I'm not in any way looking for him to to validate me or to be proud of me. I did say the other day on Beagle, though, I do know that he has to be proud of me because I turned out to be 
successful and I haven't been in prison like his other children, you know, and he doesn't have to worry about me like the other kids have. But, you know, would it have been nice to hear that he was proud of me? Yes. Am I in need of that to validate my own journey and success? No. Okay, Jason, I don't care, Lee, because, you know, if you did care, that would mean what? That would mean that you feel. Yeah, but I know I feel. No, you don't. (laughs) <laughs> no, you don't. You don't want to admit you feel because every other word is, I mean, I don't care. You know, I don't, I don't care now. You know, I mean, I wanted that, but you know, he doesn't. So, you know, I don't care, but you know, it is okay to feel. But no. why, why are we conditioned to believe that the only way we can heal is to allow ourselves to feel something when we know nothing's there? Like, why? Because it's there. What are you talking about? Obvious, Larry. <laughs> it's there. Yeah, you know, every other word is I don't care, Jason Lee. Like, what you talking about? Because, because if, you put, if you put that, oh, I care, that means that, oh, my feelings are exposed. And now people can continuously hurt me. People can continuously do the things that they used to do to me, that they used to get away with and now I now I'm a victim again and I'm not a fucking victim. I am Jason. I don't give a fuck Lee. Part of that part of that is accurate, but I will say that I do show my emotion. I'm more so with like my fans, the people that support me, the people who care about me. You know, uh I do I do talk to like I'll I'll give you another example. I think that the the relationship with Tiffany, you know, Haddish, uh when I saw her in the movie theater at Girl Strip, I went to go see Dana, but when I saw her, I go, oh, I need to know that bitch right there. Because that bitch right there, that's the energy. I need to know her. <laughs> and then I brought all my friends and my my employees back and we watched the movie again. And I was just like, yo, I and I wanted to be, I wanted to know her because I needed that type of energy in my life. And when I met her, um, and then we exchanged numbers, ended up hanging out and started to get closer. The thing that Tiffany did were, and this is where therapy shows up for me, similar to like, all mm-hmm. of you got, all of you got different things, right? Like yeah. you, you call me consistently when I'm in trouble. You're always, I'm, I sit and literally when I blow up the internet, I look at my phone three, two. Okay. There go Tamar. Now with Tiffany, <laughs> Tiffany, this is how she shows up. We'll talk. We'll be talking about our last conversation was let's go to Panama and and sleep in the jungles. I'm like, girl, I don't sleep on floors. I don't sleep Mm -hmm. in jungles. I don't. Mosquito, (laughs) sis. (laughs) (laughs) No, ma'am. No, No, ma'am. I'll be at the W while you sleep at the hut. I'll pick you up on the way to breakfast. But, But what she'll say every single call we get off, she says, I love you. And when she first started doing that shit, it was so uncomfortable for me that I would hang up on her. Right when I knew the call was ending, before she said it, because I didn't want the obligation to tell her that I loved her. Mm-hmm. So we'd be talking, talking. She's like, all right, friend. Well, I'm going to talk to you later. I would say, bye, click. And she would, and one day she called me back, and she, or she would say, I love you, and I would just hang up on her. One day she called me back. She said, why is it every time I tell you that I love you, you hang up on me? And she called me out on my shit, and I go, uh. And I had to sit, and the anxiety that would build up every call after as I knew that I love you was coming because I knew I had to say it back. I turned that from being uncomfortable to I'm going to challenge myself to say it first. I'm going to say it to her first. And then now it's just a natural thing. And I, and I do realize that there was, some, there was something there where I, had, I hadn't acknowledged that I was worthy of being loved and that she was telling, she was giving me the love that I felt for her but she was giving it to me and I wasn't able to give it back. And so we, so I've had that therapeutic experience with her where I've learned now, okay, she is such a light. And on the outside, people may think, oh, they're friends because she's Tiffany Hatcher. He's Jason Lee Hollywood. No, she literally is a light every day when I'm living or surrounded by some dark shit or negative or drama. She that one yes. phone call I know I can make that I know it's gonna lighten up my day, or she's gonna say, say something positive, or I'm gonna say something positive to her. But I agree with you, like there, there was there's something there with the love thing where I where I there is a level of vulnerability that I don't show to everybody. And I, I don't know if it's attributed to that nigga from Mississippi, my daddy, but I do yeah. know that there is something there. <laughs> <laughs> I am committing to going to therapy. I should film my therapy se- sessions. So oh, yes. And yes, put them you out. should. And put no, don't put it out, but you watch it back after, I'll say, three to six months. And I bet you, you'll be a different person. No, Wait. you should challenge yourself. Oh, my God, it'd be so good. And then put it out if you want to share. Why not just put it out? You won't see the growth. 
You have okay. to see the growth first. Okay. You know? You know, it was it's interesting enough that you said that, you know, when Tiffany and, and you were on the phone and she says, I love you, it was hard for you to hear it because you couldn't receive it. Yeah. Do you know who you love? Do I know who I love? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I know some people that I love. Um, but you know, I, I will say the one thing that when I do love somebody and they do some funny shit, I'm out. I am out. What's the sign again? My sign? Yeah. I'm a Leo. <laughs> what? No. Don't don't blame it on my zodiac because the, the Gemini's are the people that switch up. My son is a Gemini. Absolutely, that's a fact. <laughs> but but you I, I, do I know? I, I will <laughs> I will say uh, I thought about that question not too long ago where I was just yeah. like, there's not a ton of people that I love. I do love some people, and I have love for some people because I'm the type of person that once I love you and you betray me, which has been frequent. I want to fuck your whole world up. Like, I want to yeah. fuck up everything about your world. I want to rearrange your house. I want to rearrange your life. I want to rearrange your mental state. I want to fuck everything in your life up. Because it you you got me to trust you. Yeah. And look, and look you how let, you... You let that person know that you feel. Don't play with me. And they fucked it up. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. But but is it that? But but And I don't know if it's, I don't know if it's this industry or this city. Tamar, you know, people, they weasel their way in. They do. They do. And then it's there are like, people who are very trustworthy. And, you know, I do believe that once you start, you know, your counseling and your journey, that um, you'll find that person who is good enough or meet all of the boxes on this long list of checklist that you have. Are we talking but relationship? Are we talking, we're talking relationship wise. Um, you know, I'm, you know, I don't jumped over there, right? Oh, you, oh, <laughs> you felt the oh, jump. You oh, thought that that was oh. smooth. <laughs> Listen, when it com- now when it comes to that, I don't even. There's no, so in that space, there's nobody that I love right now. No, not that I love right now. So you've been in love? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Like love, love, like oh. As in, not as in Uchi, love. Walla walla, uchi bang bang, ow that. I, I I have been in love, not lust. I've been in love. Uh, and yeah, I haven't been in that. In like a the way time. I've been in love or the way, like what kind? <laughs> well, <laughs> you said I can't talk. You say you don't want no paperwork. So don't ask me no questions. No, no paperwork. <laughs> 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 oh, that nigga. Um, yeah. You know I mean... <laughs> <laughs> no, like, have you been like love, love? You know, like yeah, my I mean, kind of love, I, but like I, what I, kind? Yeah, I've been in love, love. I've been in love, love. I want that back. But honestly, I've been thinking, and this is going to sound crazy. Maybe, maybe not. I've been thinking, like, I've never had a polyamorous relationship. I'm either open to polyamorous, like maybe two people, two or three of us that live together. Three of us. Uh, or or one really good one, if I could find one. But I mean, I'm kind of just open right now. I'm focusing on myself, but I'm open to receiving love. If it shows up as one person or two, I'm ready. So that's what that looks like, huh? What? <laughs> confusion <laughs> no, no no because i believe you could be in love with more than one person at the same time yeah but it's someone that deserves all of you not they, some of you they can have all of me <laughs> <laughs> they can have all of me they can have all of me do you know how hard i, I don't even go ask you do you know how hard you know how hard it is to hate to date somebody out here it is. It's hard. You, you ain't never dated a nigga that looked like he had it all on the outside. He had the nice condo at the Ritz or whatever. Oh, and I'm, Why do I want to throw my shoes at him? <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? Like, you know, the outside looked like I'm going to let you it get all. it out. Go ahead, finish. I'm going to let the, you get it out. Go the, ahead. The outside looked like you got it all. Then when you get caught up by the crazy bitch, you realize this ain't what I needed. You've been there before, right? Of course I've been there. You know, um, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what someone presented to me. I had to heal, you know, mm-hmm. because if if I didn't get into that situation, I wouldn't have known that something was seriously wrong with me. That was within. I was hiding so much. I was so afraid of feeling. I was so afraid of dealing with the hurt and the disappointments that I really got myself into a pickle. And I didn't have to because had I been doing the work, 
then none of that would have happened to me because I would have recognized it from the representative. Mm. Yeah, know? I gotta go. I gotta go to therapy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're already good, my friend. I mean, you know, without therapy, you know, you're already good. With therapy, you'll be great. But what does um, great look like to you? What does true success look like to you? Well, I'm past equating it to money because one thing right. that F Floyd did say to me and mentoring me was that, Jason, relax. You're going to get the house. You're going to get the cars. You're going to get the jewelry. You're going to get all that. You're going to get the, you're going to get everything that you want because yeah. you're going to work hard for it. But when you get yeah. it, you're going to realize it's not going to make you happy. Back. And I'm like, nigga, you got a billion dollars. The fuck you talking about? <laughs> like, I ain't like, uh, uh, you talking oh, to yeah, a, billionaires No, Right. <laughs> you're talking, you're talking to a broke nigga. Like I need the billion. But I will tell you one thing he was right. Floyd has always been right. The money does not change how you feel about yourself. The more the money did not change the fact that I was unhealthy, that I was allowing people around me who were using me, that I wasn't loving myself and acknowledging the fact that I deserve to be loved and I needed to love myself more. Uh, even to get to a space where I could talk to you about needing to go to therapy, I wasn't there because I was like, ain't no bitch going to get paid to tell me what the fuck wrong with me. I know what the fuck wrong with me. Right. But I don't know what the fuck is wrong with me. I'm going to figure it out. You know, but I, I will say, like, success for me now is uh, well, waking up is, is success. Uh, staying focused on the higher power that drives me in terms of, like, giving me life every day and giving me the ability and the, the, the humility to work through this life, getting all the blessings from my hard work. It's not a dollar amount. It's not a deal. It's not a this friend or that friend. It's literally like, can I set a goal for myself and achieve that goal? If I can, no matter how big or small it is, that's success. If this deal gets bigger, great. If the deal keeps going, great. If the deal dies and another deal is born, great. But as long as I can wake up and stay in control of my life, and then when I hit a roadblock, be able to take a second to step out of it and pivot and keep going, I'm successful. I think the other part that made me emotional the other day when I was talking to the people on Beagle was, I know that God is using me for bigger purposes. It's not Hollywood Unlocked. Hollywood Unlocked is my passion. I know my purpose is I am the kid that everybody told wasn't going to be nothing. I'm the foster kid who was given up by his family, the kid that was touched. I was the kid that was abused. I was the kid that was shot. I was the kid that watched the person he loved the most die. I was the kid that discovered he was gay. I was the kid that was all those things. And still, in spite of it all, became everything he wanted to be. So that I know is my my purpose. And now I'm finding the ways of building the platform to share that. So that way other people out there that look like me or or see them their lives in my shoes can say, damn, like if he can do it, I know I can do it. So that to me is that when I can get into that more, that's when I know I reached uh, the success uh, of what Jason Lee was supposed to be. During this show, I like to talk to my guests about the takeaways. And what we talk about is what we have taken from the conversation. And normally, you know, I would say, oh, Jason, so what have you taken away? What is your biggest takeaway from this conversation? But I don't even think that's necessary because if you would allow me, I just want to pour into you real fast sure. of what my takeaway with this conversation is. What I have learned and what I am so excited to learn so much more is that, ladies and gentlemen, Jason Lee is a king's kid. It shows every single day that he gets up in front of people and tells his, his stories and achieves his goals and all the success that God wants to give to you because of all of the trouble and trauma that you've been through. And, you know, he wants you to know that you are worth it. And he loves you. And because you have been constant and steadfast, he wants to reward you because all of this persona that you want to give out to people underneath it all, they see themselves. And whether you want to show it or not, they see themselves. And thank you for being who you are and big enough and good enough and great enough. Thank you. I receive so that's that. what I have to say. I receive that. And 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 I pray that I, I do the work so I could become even more open to receiving it. Because something that you did say is true. There is a certain level of fear in letting people get too close because they get close. They tell you how they feel about you. And again, remember what I do for a living. Like there's certain people I just don't let get close to me because nah, nah, nigga, I'm going to talk about you. So I ain't even trying to go there. But I do 
need to be able to continue to work on allowing some people in because you can't be out here, you know, on on a motionless island by yourself all the time. No, you can't. And and the day I get to retire from doing what I do, which I hope ain't too too much longer, I want to be able to just live and do the purposeful work, you know, because there are so many people out there who, you know, kids will reach out to me, foster kids or group home kids or um, just people who thought about killing themselves or people who are struggling with losing weight and, and, and they just, they just, they give me my flowers and I read them. And that's where I get more emotional because, you know, again, when you're a person who for many years were discarded to sh- have people show up for you and say, you mean something to me, or you, you gave me my life. And when I knew people were trying to take mine, when I was where they were, I'm like, damn, like, come on, God work. And I also feel like it's important. One thing I will, is I'll say just getting out of here is that I hope another thing that people see is as much as I am, what I am and who I am. Cause I'm everything you see. I don't try to say, Oh, that's not me. I'm everything yeah. you see. I always show up and acknowledge God. I learned that from my foster parents, uh, the Easter family. They taught me how important God was. I pray. And I found myself in the restaurant the other day, Tamar, taking a shit, thanking God for everything, like everything. I'm like, man, you have literally allowed me to do anything that I want to do. Anything I want to, anything you're, you're he shows giving up me- for you, baby. He there's shows pe- up for you. There's, there's people that don't have a house and I got two houses. There's people yeah. who don't have friends and I have the people that I so want. Many. My, like, like, I just, you know, again, don't be too lit that you don't acknowledge that God is real. I mean, the points and the periods. <laughs> <laughs> now, look, I don't know about y'all, but I learned so much about my good friend, Jason Lee, doing this interview. Like, it's so crazy to think that no matter how much we think we know a person, we only really know what they want us to know when they want us to know it. <laughs> OK, just remember that little nugget right there. It's somebody out there that who really needed to hear this whole interview. And I'm glad we got that for y'all. All right. Now, make sure to check out my good friend, Jason Lee, on Hollywood Unlocked on Fox Soul and the blog. That is live 24-7 at HollywoodUnlocked.com. All right, now, before we close, I want to remind y'all that y'all girl is on Cameo. And if you're trying to think of the perfect Mother's Day gift, a note from me, a song from me, is the greatest connection, all right? Just hit your girl up on Cameo.com slash Tamar Braxton. Well, look, everybody, that's our show for the day. And if you want to hit me with a question or comment about the show, you can email me at ucwithtamar at gmail.com. That's the letters ucwithtamar at gmail.com. And listen, if nobody else has told you, remember, I love you and I truly mean it because we're all under construction together. Under Construction is a production of Mo Sauce, a Stitcher brand. It's produced by Angel Lavitz. Our recording engineer and sound designer is Rashad Smith. Music provided by Radio, an audio everywhere company. More sauce.